He's got to scoot over. He's too close to Steve. We have a lot more of our congregation doing online with us right now. Uh, so we're all together uh, remembering that we all serve one God. We're all one family, whether we're doing it in one service or two services, uh, whether we're here in the building or joining at home as well. Uh, so we welcome you uh, to praise our one true God. It's good to see you. Uh, regarding the service today, I think you've kind of seen the procedures already. Uh, we're not going to pass the offering. It's, it's standing back there by the sound booth. Uh, once the service ends, uh, just wait to be dismissed and then head out to the parking lot. Uh, but together we're here. We're here to praise. Uh, we just had this verse from First Chronicles uh, 29 offered in our daily devos, and I'd like to use it again for our call to worship. It says this, First Chronicles 29, 10 through 13. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. So with that, our call to worship, calling us to praise God for who he is, for his greatness and power and majesty. Uh, let's sing together our first hymn, To God Be the Glory, where we glorify him uh, for giving us his son, Jesus. Let's stand together and sing.
in uh, different locations, some at home, some here, and some in different situations, uh, different uh, services, uh, but we ask God to, to bind us together. So instead of um, doing our handshakes as we usually do, we're going to sing together a, a song asking God to bind us together as one congregation, even in circumstances like this. Grateful that they can um, 
be guides and comforts to their children. They offer um, a pathway, a modeling toward you that um, through them we might see um, some of your nature, your compassion, your kindness, and your love. Lord, we pray on this day that they will feel appreciation. But even for that, we also pray that all appreciation and glory is ultimately drawn back to you. We continue to pray for our church, for the leaders who are making difficult decisions on how to respond. Now and in the future, we pray for our civic leaders who are um, analyzing data and making decisions based on that. And I pray that we will offer them respect and that you give them wisdom. Lord, we pray that you uh, fulfill, we know you honor your promises and you said that the gates of hell cannot stand against your church. So we ask that you strengthen and build your church that we might persevere regardless of the situation. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we are at, uh, because it is Mother's Day, uh, instead of doing a children's message, uh, gathering kids up here together. Uh, we're going to do a Mother's Day uh, message. Uh, we're going to do a reading from Psalm uh, 127. So for Mother's Day, we'll be reading Psalm 127. I have a few things to note from it. Psalm 127 says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord, offspring a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be put to shame when they contend with their opponents in court. This is Psalm 127. Uh, on the three parts I see in this particular psalm, uh, first it says, unless the Lord builds the house, the workers labor in vain. Uh, mothers in particular are dedicated laborers in their household. They demonstrate loving care and guidance, as well as juggling hectic schedules and providing comfort to a wide variety of feelings and messes. However, this psalm tells us it's all in vain unless it's the Lord who's building the house. Mothers and fathers, unless we surrender our parenting to God and trust Him to build our children and draw them toward Himself, our labor is in vain. Next thing from the Psalm 127 I, I found in here is that children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring are a reward from Him. Uh, sometimes parents overlook this important fact, especially in moments of difficult disciplining situations, that children are a blessing from God. Uh, keeping this in mind, uh, even when they require discipline will help us. Children are a blessing. C.S. Lewis uh, has this quote. It says, children are not a distraction from more important work. They are the most important work. Uh, so we look at this and say that um, knowing that children are a blessing from God, it reminds us to, to trust God, to give us whatever we need as parents. Uh, he gives us what we need. He will equip us as parents. Uh, but I think what I like most about this passage is this analogy about children being like arrows in the hand of a warrior. We are charged with providing direction and leadership to our children. This does not mean that we point them in the same direction as the world. We're aiming for a higher target. Higher than academic success, sports, and social achievement, or even general happiness. We train them in the way they ought to go. A way that will bring them true self, or true satisfaction. Uh, we point them to the giver of good things. That together uh, we will all find satisfaction in Christ alone. Uh, so with that, we offer uh, to the mothers here and at home a happy Mother's Day. Uh, 
we uh, are preparing uh, for our scripture reading, so I invite you again uh, to stand and sing hymn number 408 called Firm and Foundation. Himself 
gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people and their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love, as each part does its work. This is our reading of Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. From this passage, we're going to identify and examine three marks of the true church. Uh, first, we're going to answer and analyze who are we? And we're going to ask, what is it that makes us the true church? So our first question is, who are we? Second, what are we like? How do we interact with others? And our third mark we're going to see from this passage is, what is it we're supposed to do? What's our job? As the true church, what is our function? What does God call us to do? Uh, so let's begin with that in mind with our first mark of the church, answering this question, who are we? And the answer is going to be found from Ephesians 2 and 3, leading up to this passage that we are called by God's grace to faith in Christ. This gospel message defines who we are as the church. Uh, Ephesians 2 tells us that we were all objects of wrath. Ephesians 2, 3 says, like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. We are sinful. This is bad news. We are deserving of his wrath. But it goes on in the same passage to tell us that God made a way for salvation through faith in Jesus. Uh, two of my favorite verses, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. This is God's salvation plan for all sinners, and it's available to Jews and Gentiles alike, people from all different backgrounds. In Ephesians 3, Paul tells us that this gospel is uh, joining Jews and Gentiles who previously were separated. Ephesians 3, 6 says, through the gospel, the Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of one body, and sharers together in the promise in Christ Jesus. Now, bringing people from different backgrounds together brings potential conflict, um, especially when you've got people with different ideas uh, and standpoints uh, coming together to make one church. And this prompts Paul to get to the message we're at in Ephesians 4. It's a call to unity, to understand who we are, how we interact with one another, and what our job is. Uh, Christ takes people from diverse backgrounds and makes them one. So there's an application here already. The only thing that unites us as a church together, as the universal church who worship the one true God, is that we're all hopeless sinners who have been saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus. This unites us to all Christians across the world as one chosen and redeemed people. It's important that we define ourselves through faith in Jesus. By grace, we're saved through faith. Because we are not defined by our skin color or our income level. We're not defined by our political views, what country we call home. We're not defined by our age, and certainly not whether we choose to attend a church in a pandemic or view it online. That's not what defines us as a church. We're not defined as a church by our stance or opinion about proper COVID-19 response. The only thing that makes us God people as the true church is faith in Jesus, which means 
Even if you've been attending church your whole life, but have not turned from your sin and trusted in Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, you're not a member of the true church. So if this is you, we see our sin and failure to live up to God's standard as a barrier. Uh, our sin is a barrier between us and God, and we see that Jesus has come to offer his righteousness and forgiveness of sins to those with true faith. So the question is then, what is true faith? How can we know we are saved? The Heidelberg Catechism answered this, and I'd like to read it. In question 21, the question is, what is true faith? True faith is not only a sure knowledge by which I hold as true all that God has revealed to us in Scripture. It is also a wholehearted trust which the Holy Spirit creates in me by the gospel that God has freely granted not only to others but to me also forgiveness of sins, eternal righteousness, and salvation. These are gifts of sheer grace granted solely by Christ's merit. To those of you already who have true faith, be assured that you are a member of the true church. You are a member of the body of Christ. This is who we are. This is the first mark of the church, that we are called by grace to faith in Christ. But the second mark of the church asks this. If this is how we become the church, what should we be like? How do we interact with one another? And Ephesians 4, our passage that we saw uh, and read today, calls for peace and unity in the church. That the church will be defined and marked with peace and unity. Ephesians 4, 3 says this. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. So, how do we display unity and peace as the church? We have to be equipped by the Holy Spirit. And as equipped by the Holy Spirit, believers are going to be humble, gentle, patient, and bear with each other in love. That's exactly what Ephesians 4, 2 says. Be completely humble and gentle, be patient, bearing with one another in love. Each of these virtues, humility, gentleness, patience, and love, requires that we deny ourselves. It requires the denial of self. A commenter I read on this said, when self dies and Christ springs to life within our hearts, then there comes the peace, the oneness, the togetherness, which is the great hallmark of the true church. These traits, humility, gentleness, patience, and peace, they're a natural outpouring of faith of God's redeemed people. Interesting, in this passage, the word one is used seven times in just three verses. Between Ephesians 4, 4, and 4 through 6, one is used seven times. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. Uh, why would we have all of these ones? Uh, the same commenter said, clearly, Paul wants his readers to catch the splendid vision of one church thoroughly united in one Lord. All of God's chosen and redeemed people are now one. One community under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, a new humanity at peace with God through faith in Jesus. So what's our application here? If the second mark of the church, what are we like, is marked by peace and unity, the application must be that we stop being divided by our differences, especially regarding biblically unclear items. I'm going to try to posit a list here of things that should not separate us. The music in our services, politics, worship preferences, committees, or even response to COVID-19. The Bible doesn't tell us definitively how we ought to handle some of these issues. And we may have different opinions of what is honoring to God. And that's okay. Our response as a church is to be humble, gentle, patient, and bear with one another in love. It's okay not to agree on these issues, but we must interact with humility and strive for peace. There are other issues, though, that we cannot, for the sake of unity, accept what the Bible clearly defines as sin. We have to take a stand 
under the headship of Christ, under his word of what is right or wrong. So, there are some issues. Um, we're going list to list here sexual immorality or pornography, drunkenness, greed. We do not tolerate sin so that we can promote unity. Our unity comes from a great submission to the authority of Christ through his revealed word. So certainly, we must teach, rebuke, and correct when we see proclaimers of Christ stray from his word. But we do it with gentleness, humility, and tact. Not looking to ostracize, but to restore back to Jesus. This is done for the sake of unity. Also, if a member of the church comes to us, coming with the word of God and points out sin in our own lives, when we are corrected, we need to accept it humbly and repent ourselves, again, for the sake of unity. The effectiveness of our witness of the gospel of Christ hinges on unity of the church. If we're not united in the church, the gospel of Jesus is not appealing to those outside of the church. Uh, this is what Jesus prays in John 17. He actually prays for us, the people who will believe later from the apostles' message. Listen to his prayers. I'm going to read John 17, 20 through 23. How often he, he calls for his church to be one or united. And for what purpose? Listen to the so that the world. All right? This is Jesus' prayer. My prayer is not for them alone, his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. Jesus is praying for us, verse 21. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I am them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them, even as you have loved me. So we're marked by unity and peace. We've talked on who we are. People called by grace to face faith in Christ. We say what we're like. We're marked by peace and unity. And that brings us to the last question. Well, then what do we do? What is our purpose or our function? The third mark of the church is service to each other and the world. The first six verses of Ephesians 4, they talk about the qualities of the members of Christ's church. Humility, patience, gentleness, bearing with one another in love. Those are qualities. But the back half of Ephesians 4 is now talking about the function of the church. What is it that we do? Not just what we're like. What is it God is calling us to do? The church is a unified body that consists of many diverse parts with diverse gifts that are equipped, empowered, and united to do Christ's work in the world. Let's read Ephesians 4, 11 through 12. Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Our purpose is to serve. Being built up as members of the true church has an end result. Ephesians 4.13 says, Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. We've already talked about unity. Unity is something uh, that's naturally built in as we become more like Jesus. Uh, we set off to become like Jesus. Our brothers and sisters do the same thing. And as we approach him, we're becoming more united together as we become more like him. But then it says, besides unity, we're also to attain to the whole measure of the fullness of God. Attain to the full, or the whole measure of the fullness of God. What does that mean? Uh, I've got a quote from a guy named Erasmus Sarsarius. This is a contemporary uh, German theologian who worked alongside Martin Luther in the Reformation. He took this passage and made this statement. 
The person who attains to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ is the one who does his best to imitate him, who believes in God the Father as Christ did, who pays attention to what Christ wants as Christ did, and who expresses the life of Christ in his own life. In other words, the aim of the members of the church is to become like Christ. We're gradually transformed by the Holy Spirit to be more and more like Jesus as we proclaim the kingdom of God to the world. This is done in both word and deed. Uh, I love this picture in Ephesians 4 of the church as Christ's body. Speaking the truth in love, we will become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ, verse 15 and 16. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love as each part does its work. The church is God's instrument for reaching the world with the love of Christ. We all have a role to play or to serve in order to accomplish this work. E.F. Scott writes this, The great bond of union among Christians is their service to one Lord. So each of these things, uh, who we are, what we, what we are like, and what we do, uh, these marks of the church, being called by God's grace to faith in Christ, living in peace, unity, and love with one another, and living like Jesus in service to each other in the world, they all are under the headship of Jesus. They all mark the supreme authority of Jesus. They all hinge on the lordship, authority, and empowering of Jesus Christ. This is how Ephesians starts, and this theme continues. The headship and lordship of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1.22 says, And God placed all things under his feet, and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So, concluding, let us find our identity as members of the true church, as redeemed sinners by faith in Christ, who are united together through selfless humility, gentleness, patience, and love, so that we can do Christ's work in the world under the lordship of Jesus Christ for the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Lord, this is what we ask. We are grateful that by grace we have called our people to true faith, that we might be members of one church. And as members of one church, we ask for peace, unity, that is marked by humility and gentleness, patience and love that only you can give us. Lord, we depend on you to make us more and more like Jesus, that we not only interact with one another in unity and peace, but that we display your goodness to the world as an act of service to our one Lord and King, Christ, who is head over all. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, let's respond together to this message with a hymn. Uh, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Please stand.
remain standing as we hear our benediction. Our benediction is from Romans 15, 5 through 6. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, at this point, we're going to uh, begin, uh, do our doxology, and then we'll start uh, processing up. 